You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. We had a really top end guest today, Dr. Joseph Mercola. Uh, Dr. Mercola's bio is going to be super extensive, so it's better if he tells you. But what I can tell you is that he's been around for dozens of years in the alternative health space. Unfortunately, it's called the alternative health space. It really should be the mainstream health space. Um, he comments and has an understanding of many, many aspects of health from what I've seen, and it's a fresh perspective. Versus the traditional, you know, give you pills, do surgery on you, irradiate you, and hospitalize you type model. So, uh, Joe, thanks so much for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Yeah, if you don't mind, tell me about your history. What first inspired you to uh, care about health? Well, let me first clarify that uh, I haven't been around for thousands of years, but I have uh, had a presence on the Internet for quite some time. Um, We've been the most visited natural health site, which is the term I prefer to use for the last 17 years. Uh, At one point prior to Google decimating us and taking us out of the search engines, we had 30 million viewers a month, down considerably since then. But anyway, my passion is getting people better without drugs or surgery. And I've taught a lot of people around the world, millions, hundreds of millions of people actually, uh, how to do that and uh, protect themselves from the drug model and and surgery, which is uh, really not further best interest typically. Uh, It's it's basically uh, fraught with side effects and complications that never address the fundamental reasons why people are getting sick. So my site has been up before Google existed, actually, uh, 22 years. And um, my first interest in health was actually in 1968 when I first started exercising. And actually, when I took my first programming class, which was COBOL and Fortran in 1968. And was actually first online in 77. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. I, I love technology, which is one of the reasons I was able to spread my message of natural health so effectively because I've been a tech advocate for a long, long time. So and I've got- so You're uh, Dr. Mercola. What, what's your designation? Did you go in and get a medical degree or yeah. why are you called uh, Dr. Mercola? Because I'm a physician. That's the primary, primary reason. So I uh, went to medical school and graduated in 1982 and did my board, uh, board certified family practice uh, and finished that in 1985. Yeah. So I, I went to medical in 78, graduated in 82, and then I did a three-year residency in family practice and uh, actually practiced quite conventional medicine for the first five or six years. And I transitioned over and uh, started learning approaches that were getting people better than no one else could. And, eventually had people coming from all over the world to see me. So I thought it would be wise to share this information to a broader people uh, by having a website. And, uh, you know, I'm often criticized for selling supplements, but for the first three or four years of my site, we never sold anything. It was never designed to be a a, hell, a revenue generating business. It was just designed and, and focused on helping people get better without uh dying prematurely from expensive and dangerous medications and surgeries. Well, I went into to medicine and health to really get people healthier, not to really to treat disease like most of my classmates said. So I was an outlier at the beginning. And 
uh, from there, I uh, just didn't understand that there were, uh, there were a number of physicians already who had a similar interest. And it took me a while to find them and get networked in before I really started uh, improving and increasing my understanding of how to use natural medicine to help people get be- better and healthy. So what, um, you know, 30 some odd years ago versus now, what are some of the big changes you've seen in people and their health? Well, people are getting sicker on a regular basis, uh, largely as a result of uh, two primary issues, vaccines, which the use of vaccine recommendations has exploded since I started practicing. Initially, it was just a few. Now it's many dozens, it's close to 100 vaccines. And then we've got the introduction of many more synthetic chemicals, including pesticides or herbicides like Roundup, which uh, is being sprayed at the tune of 5 billion pounds a year in the world. So they combine those two and also the explosion of EMF exposures. You've got a recipe for, for biologic disaster. Yeah, you know, I sat and thought, you know, the average person will, you know, use shampoo with chemicals in it, deodorant. They may put on makeup, you know, mm-hmm. body sprays. Um, they're using their phone and other equipment all the time. They're breathing in who knows what in the ambience. You know, the food they're eating is processed and it's it just seems like an all out assault on the body from many many angles what, yeah. what are your thoughts there i'd agree I, i'm not so sure how intentional it is it's just an artifact of seeking to optimize revenues for many of these multinational corporations without any regard to long-term health uh, some of these companies like monsanto and bear understand and know quite clearly the the dangerous consequences of their products others are just ignorant uh, and there are large, massive loopholes in many of our protective regulatory agencies that really don't even require safety testing in many of these chemicals, let alone the synergistic combination of many of these chemicals. So it's, a pre- it's actually a prescription for disaster. And we're seeing that. This is the first generation in the history of the United States that will not live as long as the previous generation. You know, when people say that, how much less do you do, do people anticipate that they will live or will they live same number of years just in a less healthy way? Be more no, it's significantly say. less. It's going down. The health, the lifespan is going down probably by a few years, but we have an optimized lifespan and health span at the same time. So what we have really focused on is getting people to live longer, usually in a decrepit state, frail and uh, in, a, in a bedridden or in a wheelchair uh, with many chronic diseases. So the goal is to live well beyond a hundred years, which is biologically more than possible without any frailty, without any dysfunction and having the full capacities you had when you were 30, 40 and 50 years old. So, um, it seems like scientists are saying that people are not going to live as long as this current generation, but what, again, what about health span? How will that be impacted in the same way? A shorter health span? Oh, absolutely. Probably even, accelerate more quickly. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's listening to this is, is destined to that future. Uh, if you understand these fundamental biological principles and apply them to yourself personally, you can avoid this disaster. Uh, and uh, many of the people who follow my site, and certainly me, uh, plan on avoiding that completely. And have, for the most part, been successful at doing that. What's it like from the perspective of, a, you know, of an average person, you think? Do they, are they just going along, feeling fine, and then things are slowly creeping on them. And then all of a sudden they're in this new regime where they're not feeling well, or they're now become somewhat disabled. Like what, what do you think is the experience and the mental model of people as they, you know, as they age? Well, you just, from an observational perspective, you can see it in the disease statistics. We have epidemics of Alzheimer's, which is on the far end. They lose their mind, the ability to think clearly and have any mental clarity or, or remember or memory. But you have also have epidemics of diabetes and obesity, high blood pressure, heart, heart, uh, myocardial infarctions or heart attacks and cancer. So all these diseases are going up. Arthritis is another one. So people are suffering from them and they're having to, most people are taking multiple medications. You know, that's a really good indication that they bought into the model because you shouldn't be taking any medications. It's the rare indication that there's ever a drug that you need to take. I mean, they, not to say they should never be used, but they should certainly rarely be used. We're probably using it 
more than three orders of magnitude than we need to be. And the evidence of the opioid epidemic is a classic example. We've got probably more, significantly, four times as many people died from opioid overdoses than they have from, uh, that participated in the Vietnam War or died in the Vietnam War. That's crazy. Um, well, I guess to, to make it even worse, I just recently read the book, uh, Bottle of Lies with Catherine Eban, where she talks about generic drugs not even being what they oh, are sure. represented on their labels. So it makes it even worse. Right. Uh, it's very interesting investigative journalist. I heard her three hour or two to three hour interview with Peter Atia, and, which is a lot easier to, to listen to than read her book. But I, I probably should interview her too. She's she did, did a really magnificent job. Uh, it focuses oh, yeah. on the, dr- the drugs, which we don't really get into, other than to tell people they're dangerous. But this is another clear example of dangers that you don't. That's not even recognized because even the major pharmaceutical companies are using these generics. So, and this was one of the biggest generic pro- comp- generic producing c- companies in the entire world in India. It was huge. It was a multi billion dollar company. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would think a lot of people would, you know, be frightened if they have high blood pressure or diabetes or some other condition, and they would be scared to not use the drugs that are recommended to them and scared to not follow their doctor's protocol. So yeah. what what do people like that do? Like, how do they start to address, you know, there's all these things, let's, I guess there's a whole list of shoulds of things that they should do. But let's say someone has a condition that's recently diagnosed, they're still in that, you know, oh my God, what am I going to do stage? What are some of your first recommendations for people on how to get a handle on their health? Yeah. And the ultimate diagnosis or example of that for a diagnosis is cancer, which is, you know, maximizes fear to the, to the fullest. And, you know, you even though cancer takes many years to develop there, they make you believe that you have to do something that very day or that week. Yeah. The furthest thing from the truth. And then they make these decisions that have usually irreversible consequences as a result of the, the rashness and lack of proper investigation and what to do. But it's a good question because fear motivates many people. And the diseases you mentioned are for the most part pretty benign. They're very safe and almost in every case is completely, completely irreversible without medication to treating that once, once you treat the foundational causes. So I'm biased, of course. I've been doing this for decades and I would strongly suggest you go to my site, Mercola.com, because you will not you I mean previously, even as little even as early as this earlier this year, we could just say go to Google and figure it out. Because Google was a democratic process. They they didn't censor, but now they're censoring. They've, they've removed my entire site from the search engine. And not just my site, but hundreds, if not thousands of other sites that, that share this information that can tell you what to do to get off the medications. But if you know what the sites are, you can just go to sites directly and use those sites. So my site is Mercola.com. And uh, there's literally tens of thousands of articles there to go this into this in great detail. So, but simply... The, the, there's two major principles that you can do. One is to, well, three, stop eating processed food. You know, two thirds of the, two thirds, two thirds of the food that people eat in this country is ultra processed. And that is food defined that you can eat that purchase at a uh, gas station. That's two thirds of the food people are eating. And then there's another, almost a third, you know, up to 90% of the people eat are in a processed food. So you want to stop eating processed foods. The most particular, you would think sugar is the worst and most people know, believe that, but actually it's the processed vegetable oils that are particularly problematic because sugar t- taken in l- large doses over long periods of time can develop something called insulin resistance, which is really at the core of most foundational diseases. So cer- certainly long-term use of sugar is problematic, but short-term intermittent exposure and rational use of sugar is not a problem. What is a problem, even any small amounts of processed vegetable oils, uh, usually from plants like corn oil, canola, cottonseed oil, uh, safflower, sunflower. The, all these are highly perishable uh, oils and easily damaged and frequently are damaged, especially when they're cooked. And those, those aren't just burned for fuel. Those are integrated into your cell membranes and they can cause damage for a long time after you've eaten them. So that, you know, so first thing is st- stay away from processed food, make most of your food, uh, at home or pay someone to do it for you. You know, so someone should be making the food fresh in the kitchen every day. That's number one. 
Number two, which is not easy, but you know, if you're looking for the long-term solution, it's a, and certainly going to be, it'll be less expensive in the long run, not time-wise, but less expensive in the initial cost. And certainly far more extensive when you factor in the, the savings from all the, the, the disease and disability that you're going to incur from consuming processed foods. So that's number one. Number two is in a sort of an artifact of that, which is stop drinking fluids except for water. Uh, so st- eliminate the juices, the sodas, fruit juices, people think are, are healthy for you. And, uh, that's not true because they're highly processed. So they're not, ne- nothing, nothing necessarily intrinsically wrong with fresh fruits, but fruit juices should be avoided, uh, as should, uh, all soda. And that's uh, including diet soda, because these artificial sweeteners are every bit as bad, if not worse than, than the sugar. So switching over to that, and the third strategy, and these are powerful strategies. If you do all three of them, you can probably reverse 80% of disease. And the third one is something relatively new that many people probably haven't heard of, and it's called time-restricted eating. They may have heard of intermittent fasting, but it's more accurately called time-restricted eating. And some really prominent researchers have shown that once you, that first of all, 90% of the people listening to this, 90%, are eating more than 12 hours a day, 12 hours a day. And there's, that's 90%. My guess is 50% are eating from the time they get up to the time they go to sleep. So that is a prescription for biologic disaster because it will not allow your body to engage one of the most powerful mechanisms it has to keep you healthy, which is the recycling, repair, and regeneration mode. And it, we call it autophagy uh, from two Greek words, auto meaning self and phagy, phago. Phagy from the word Greek word phagos meaning eat. So it's self eating. Your body essentially digests all the damaged intracellular parts that uh, would otherwise hang around and clutter up the system and cause you massive problems and complications. And you can't activate that system if you're eating all day long. And our ancestors never did that. We were never designed. Our, it's not about not our genes. It's not about biochemistry. It's not our met- metabolic system to accommodate for this. So you can get away with it for a short term. But if you do it chronically, as most people do, you're going to get sick prematurely. You will gain weight. You will develop insulin resistance. You get diabetes, uh, yeah. high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, you name it. So it's a simple strategy. You basically progressively and slowly decrease your eating window, the, the, the number of hours that, the, that you can eat from 12 down to 10, down to six, and maybe even eventually two or four hours. Um, four hours would be pretty challenging for most people. It's actually what I do though. I'm, I only eat in four hour window from 10 o'clock in the morning to two o'clock in the afternoon. Today, it was, today it was 1030 to 230. So, and it, it, you may say, oh, it takes iron willpower. Well, by doing that process, especially doing it gradually, you develop what's called metabolic flexibility. You have the ability to burn either fat or sugar seamlessly. Most people listening to this can't burn fat. They can only burn sugar because they're eating 24 seven and they're essentially they're not, the only time they're not eating is when they're sleeping. And that's not a lot, lot enough time to deplete the, the liver primarily of, of glucose or glycogen. And as a result, there's never any need to burn fat because you always have glucose stores around and that's not right. right. And when, when, when you, when you do that on a long-term basis, you just lose the ability to burn fat. And so you gradually accumulate it and you store it, which is highly problematic and really a primary factor. Why so many people are that probably practically contributes to so many chronic diseases. How long have you been doing a, you know, restricted time restricted eating protocol? I'd say five or six years. Oh, wow. what, what was it like for you when you first tried it versus now? Well, it was never really hard. I mean, I have enormous discipline. So it's a little bit of a challenge for anyone doing it the first week or two until you make the transition and your metabolic be flexible. Once you are, your body typically has enough fat stores to keep you alive for a few months, if not longer. Some people over a year. I mean, literally, they could, they could almost fast and not eat anything or drink anything but water for a year and lose weight. Now, these are people who are typically over four or 500 pounds. Um, yeah. And that's a good, that's a good strategy. And interesting when you lose weight that way, instead of going on a low calorie diet, your autophagy system is ra- radically up, up, up regulated. As a result, you don't have to go to for surgery to remove the extra fat tissue on your, from your skin on your belly. That's a result that most people do because your body takes care of it, just eats it and digests it for food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. You don't yeah. end up with loose skin. 
Yeah. Versus other weight loss methods. Yeah. So that's the problem. You know, people go on low weight, low calorie dicing. That's going to be effective, but actually no calories is far more effective. And then doing that and then maybe having a few days where you're eating and going in and out, in and out of that cycle and cycling, it can be a really powerful strategy to get healthy quickly, especially if you're have a challenge with a serious disease like cancer where you have to do something quickly. So that's when you're getting into a very aggressive fasting mode and seeing a clinician who understands how to treat the fundamental causes is really helpful. Yeah, do you do uh, periodic fasts where you won't eat at all for a day or two or more? I was doing it for a long time. I would do a five-day fast a few times a year, but I'm trying to gain weight, so it's really hard to do that. Even if I don't eat for a day, I tend to lose three or four pounds, maybe sometimes even five pounds. So I don't want to do that. I'm trying to keep on my muscle mass. So. And then um, going back to the first thing you talked about, which is uh, not eating processed food and making it yourself as much as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've noticed that uh, what's difficult about food is that, you know, you can look at two pieces of, uh, of chicken or two chicken dinners and they may look to your eye the same, but one could be organic, you know, grass fed, one could be, or sorry, free range, one could be, uh, you know, processed and until you eat it, you may not even, you may only be able to tell by taste and texture, but by eye, you can't see it. And that's, it seems like that's one of the big challenges with um, yeah. even determining when, you, when you're out and about, is it possible to get non-processed food or is that just... It typically isn't. And I wouldn't, I would advise most people to avoid eating chicken, uh, especially if you're a woman and you have recurrent urinary tract infections, because if you bring raw chicken into your house, it almost invariably is contaminated with typically E. coli and salmonella. And all you have to do is touch it and then you bring it into the house. It's on the sink, it's on the handles and... And then you wind up, the women wind up getting it and they get a urinary tract infection from it. So that's one reason, but there's, it's just not a good food to eat. That doesn't mean you shouldn't eat eggs. Uh, some people are allergic to it. If you are, don't eat them. But chicken is not a good food to eat at all. I avoid it like the plague. Now, duck is fine. A goose is even better. Uh, pheasants, you know, other birds are fine, but chickens are, unless you're, even if you're raising, I raise my own chickens. I have like nine chickens. So I have about six eggs a day, mostly just the yolks, because um, I you don't want to have excess protein. So, and, the, and there's a lot of new, the eggs are probably one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet, uh, especially the yolk, not the whites. So, a lot of good. Yeah, nutrients. Even if you uh, even if you prepare your own chicken and you get what what you think is good organic free range chicken, you're saying uh, not it, a good it, idea. It's, if you were doing that, it's probably okay. But then you've got and not only do you have to raise it, then you have the challenge of of uh, preparing it, you know, and that's another, it's another, some people are good at it. I'm, I'm not. And I, so I just don't enjoy that. I get it from uh, most of my meat from uh, uh, an organic farm, actually a biodynamic regenerative agriculture farm that raises these animals in a humane way and, and actually contributes to decrease global warming. Because when you raise animals in a way that it's not industrially uh, like industrial farming, then you actually increase the carbon content of the soil rather than putting it into the atmosphere like traditional farming does or, or, um, or raising of animals or agriculture. Hmm. Yeah. I want to point out the hidden, the hidden problems, or at least they seem hidden. So why is it near impossible or nearly impossible or so difficult to get non-processed food if you eat out? You know, what if I go to a place that cooks in front of me? Is there any benefit to that or it's meaningless? Or, well, you have to look at the- a restaurant. You have to look at their supply and sources. So where are they buying it from? I mean, there's really, you know, most people don't understand that there is no penalty for a restaurant to lie on its menu. They could say whatever they want and no one's going to come in there and give them a fine. They could Now, there is a penalty for their integrity. And if people start finding out about it, they might lose business, but there's no legal penalty for it. And most people aren't aware of that. So, I mean, you've got to know where they're getting their food from. And once you go into a restaurant, who goes into the back of the kitchen and talks to the manager or the owner to see where their sources are? Like hardly anyone. So you just have to assume the worst. Now, there are exceptions and there are restaurants that are known for committing themselves to providing the highest quality food. And they, they exist. They're few and far between, but they're out there. Uh, in my own community, there's only really one restaurant in our entire community that does this. So... Um, but they could, but there are others that say they would be organic or, you know, wild caught fish and they can give you the, the worst 
farm raised fish and not get pay a penalty at all. And you would be no the wiser except you pay for it. And this is well documented in many books. I don't know what percentage of uh, restaurants lie, but do you think it's a pretty significant percentage? It's high enough that you're going to, if you're, if you're eating out regularly, you're going to encounter it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've Especially, seen reports where, where they'll tell you you're getting fish A and it's actually fish B. Right. And- yeah. And the, the higher the price of the fish, the more likely that that's going to be because the potential for increased profits increases pretty dramatically. So they'll, they'll uh-huh. advertise it from really expensive ship sh- fish and give you something that's, you know, essentially not. And they, they prepare it in a way there's no way to tell. That's what I was going to ask you. What if someone's like, oh, I can tell, you know, I've had much fish or much meat in my life and I can tell. Is that true? Or has anyone even studied that? Um, I don't know. I mean, some people might be, be able to, to discern that. They'd have to have a pretty sensitive palate. Mm. But most of the time they put sauces on it and and they disguise the, the texture and the appearance so that it's like really physically almost impossible to do it. Hmm. What about the... Uh, I guess I call it the, the European vacation effect. It seems like you know, even Peter Tia said this too, you know, you go over to Europe and you eat and you eat things maybe you wouldn't even eat here and yet somehow you feel a lot better and less inflamed and lose weight. Is there, have you looked into that? And is there any idea in your mind why? Well, Europe t- typically in many countries, they are uh, more assiduous about avoiding some of these dangers like GMOs and, and uh, non-organic foods. So, uh, and their grains that they use typically tend to be a bit better. So there's, it's a little bit easier in Europe, but you know, it's still, still a challenge and you've got to be very careful. Yeah. It's not a panacea, but I just wondered if you've experienced that effect yourself. And uh, you know, no, you know, I, on. I typically don't go to Europe. So, okay. And maybe you eat so well that if you went there, you'd be worse off. So. <laughs> it's possible, but typically when I travel and I do travel almost once a month, I bring my own food and my own water. Really? Yeah, I don't. I don't eat out. Wow, yeah, that's great. Well, um, in terms of containers, I mean, people would use, let's say, maybe plastic Tupperware versus glass. Uh, yeah, how important? To... How, how important is the container if you're going to do this? Well, it depends on what you're putting in it, but uh, typically glass is always better. Uh, so that's that's my primary strategy. I put my food in glass containers and travel with them. So. It's not hard to do. I mean, you see, you're typically going to have to check your luggage, which is fine. I always check my luggage, so I'm pretty much prepared. You don't have problems when you go through TSA that they're, they're no, no, out your food. And, you know. No, it's I'm, the luggage is checked, so it's not an issue. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I, I guess you know the benefit of uh, time restricted eating is is tremendous because if you're going to make all your own food mm-hmm. and you're not time restricted, I can see someone saying, "Oh, that's a lot of work." and I have to bring all this stuff with me and it has to be refrigerated. And but if you're time restricted, it's definitely conceivable that at least half of what you eat during the day or most of it is eaten while you're at home. You know, if you just eat when, before you go to work and then eat when you get home, um, that probably takes care of it. You don't have to take stuff with you. No, you don't, you, you don't, but you could, and it's not that hard to do. I mean, I do it when I travel, I'll, I'll, I'll bring all the food for two or three days typically. Usually if it's longer than that, I'll make sure I'm in a place where I can get food. But it's really hard when you're traveling to find good food. And that's an understatement. It's very hard. So are you, are you still in the uh, direct uh, patient advisory role at all? Or is it just that no. you're, you know, okay. But if, I stopped seeing uh, patients about 12 years ago. But I'm sure you speak with many practitioners that do see patients. Um, sure, all the time. What, what do they find that people have a hard time with? You know, let's say talk about the time restricted feeding or the not eating processed foods. Like, you know, these recommendations are excellent, but what are the things that really make it difficult for people to follow them? Well, usually the biggest challenge is social issues. So, especially if you have a family. So, if you know, I stopped eating before three, and many people are working at that time, and uh, and when they come home, they have a wife and children, and the you know, f- dinner is typically viewed as a co- social gathering and connection where. You connect with your family so that is a potential problem but it could be solved it's easily solved i mean you don't have to eat you can still have that time together and share it and drink water or do something as a family so it's just typically uh done with with food so i think that's probably the biggest issue well you find family members and friends of the person that is undergoing you know this transformation they say come on eat something or you know, you're going to starve yourself or, you know, is it, is there a lot of pressure socially? It depends on their family. 
could be, mm, but yeah. you know, it, and you know, most everyone in the family would benefit from doing this, except if uh, there was a family member who was pregnant or was underweight or was a child. You typically don't want to put a child or a pregnant woman on time restricted eating. Not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. So, but if that's that's not typically the case. So if that isn't the case, then almost everyone in the family is going to benefit. So it's going to help them too. And it's going to slow down the aging process quite dramatically. And more more importantly, improve the health span, the, the time that you're going to be able to live uh, with having full capacities. Do you find that uh, I don't know, people's food bill goes down or do they eat tons of food in the small restricted window? No, no, you, you, there's really no limit to the amount of food you can eat or want to, should eat. You know, it's not, this is not something where you count your calories. Uh, normally, for most people, having less carbohydrates is typically a better strategy and avoiding most of the, the grains, um, especially gluten grains, which should be not only wheat, but barley, rye, oats, and spelt. So that's typically a good strategy and uh, because most of them are contaminated with glyphosate or Roundup. That's one. Even, uh, I mean, it, it have to be organic. And even then, it still may be contaminated. You just don't know. Yeah. You'd have to test it yourself to be sure. And it's probably not a bad idea if you're going to be consuming that food for a lots of it for a long period of time. And the tests are terribly expensive. It's about $100 or so. What, what about uh, what is eaten during the time that you do eat? You know, non-processed, great. But what, what about the macro composition? Do you, you know, what is your thoughts on veganism versus carnivore diet or keto? Or Well, I'm not a big fan of veganism, that's for sure. I think everyone yeah. needs some animal protein. Uh, I'm, if, if you were to do one thing, there seems to be a lot of benefit to being carnivore and removing all vegetables and fruits from your diet uh, because uh, lots of people notice, uh, especially if they have autoimmune issues, that it tends to improve quite dramatically. So that's a, that's a big plus. Uh, yeah. it, but it's a, it's a bit more challenging to do because you have to have high quality sources and you just can't eat ribeyes and steak all day long. It needs to be a more comprehensive carnivore approach, to, which is typically nose to tail, which includes not only the muscle meat, but the organ meat, and then also connective tissue. Because uh, you have to balance out these amino acid ratios, specifically methionine and glycine. So, but done correctly, it could it basically is a pretty strict keto. So you have very low carbs, and you're generating really high amounts of ketones, and your insulin levels very low, and your blood blood uh, work looks really really excellent. For most people are doing this, and most of their autoimmune diseases just disappear. So it's an interesting, especially if you combine it with time restricted eating. Yeah, I guess that's the one-two punch, really. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions about the time restriction. Uh, have you seen much benefit if someone goes to, you know, from 16 hours of eating down to 12 even? Is there a big improvement there or do you really need to get down into the, you know, no, four hour window? Hardly, hardly anything at 12 hours. It really, the, the magic doesn't start to happen until a minimum of about 14 and probably closer to 16 because you have to exhaust those glycogen levels. And you just don't don't do it in twelve hours. I mean, it's a start. It's certainly better than you know than eating for sixteen hours. But um, you really need to restrict the eating to it. I would say a minimum of fourteen to sixteen. I do twenty, you know, twenty hours, which is probably unnecessary for most people. But I would the goal really should be sixteen hours. I think, which gives you eight hours to eat. That's a long time. I mean, that's twice the long time I'm eating. Well, yeah, from your perspective, right? Yeah, but from someone that's eating constantly. That's yeah. like, oh, my God, I'm going to starve. <laughs> no, that's the thing. Once you're metabolically flexible, and I didn't emphasize this enough, it's really almost magical. Your cravings disappear. You are not hungry, and I can assure you with the highest degree of confidence. This is not a, 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 a test of mental willpower at all. You just aren't, but you got to do it slowly to get to that phase. You're just satiated. You're full. You're satisfied. There's no temptations. There's, you just, there's is a non-issue. In, in every way, shape, and form. So the, the thing to do then seems like first is, well, I guess, okay, so if you had to put your recommendations in order, mm -hmm. sounds like first thing should be try to make all your own food. Don't eat processed foods. Yeah. And then yeah, whenever you are eating, uh, go low carb, um, any other recommendations on the eating part, and then the time restricted part, or in, is there an order in which people should do this? Well, probably time restricted eating is the most important because you, there's many animal studies that show really clearly that 
even if you, if you have two animal populations and you have give one uh, access to food 24 seven and the other puts in a really rigid time restricted eating window and they're given the same damn bad diet the the dot the ones the animals that are eating continuously just too terribly well come on with all these diseases they age prematurely and die much sooner than the other the other animals even though they're eating the same bad food so i would say and it's a lot easier to do to restrict your eating window than it is to change the food you're eating so i would do that first like right away because then as you see as you're feeling better and your health starts to improve then you know this is working and you have the trust and confidence to make adopt some of these other changes well if you're eating uh, you know lots of carbs and all that having big blood sugar swings it might be very hard to do the time restricted that's why maybe well, that's why you gotta, that's why no that's why you have to do it slowly so you, you know you can do some of them you, cutting down the carbs first would be a good idea but you don't go from eating 16 hours a day down to four yeah, that's not yeah. going to happen. You will be a miserable person. I can assure you. <laughs> and uh, and you might even get sick, and you'll have there's a there's a you don't do it rapidly. And this is not this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you can yeah. do it over a few weeks, and a few weeks is is more than enough time to make the transition. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So um, you said that about eighty percent of uh, health issues, from your observation, appear to be resolved if you do these things you're mentioning. Yeah, just just those three things would probably be enough. Now, maybe it's a little less than eighty, but probably close to three fourths of the people are going to get better, noticeably better. Mm-hmm. And to get rid of some of the other things, it becomes more problematic. And there's a lot of other things you need to do. And you know, seeing a physician or clinician who is understands these principles and is able to customize it for you would be helpful. Yeah, how do you find a doctor that understands these things and not a traditional one? Like, how do you? Is it a functional doctor, or is that not even enough? Like. Uh, that is a good question. So it is a challenge. Um, probably the best recommendation I have is to go to your local health food store, go to several of them in your community, and almost every community has them, and ask the owner, ask the employees who they would recommend locally, who's good, and then ask your friends and neighbors. You, you need to tie into a network that's, that's sort of uh, socially validated the clinicians there because it doesn't matter what certification, what courses you took, who you know. I mean, ultimately, it, it, it boils down to that clinician understanding the principles and having a personality that's able to engage and catalyze people to action and get results. So once a person starts doing that and any significant number of people, the community will know. You just have to tie into that. Okay. Well, very good. Any, uh, what, what resources uh, would you suggest? Is it just Mercola.com is the best way or what ways would you suggest for people? To find yeah, I would say Mercola.com. I've got a new book coming out in the spring. Actually, yeah, the spring, maybe the winter, it might be February. Um, it's on EMF, which is another danger, you know, the abuse of we could spend three or four hours talking about this. But uh, 5G is coming. They've got the 5G global satellite internet coming. It's already being deployed. We've got 60 satellites up there now. Uh, broadcasting these signals. So we're going to be inundated with these EMFs. And that's another way that you can hit, cause harm and biological damage. It didn't exist before, really. Uh, just if you think about it, as I said earlier, I was on the internet in the 70s. And, and I'm sure you can remember even from the last century that and when you were on the internet, it was not, it was not wireless. It was all wired. Right. Yeah. Initially, you were it was a phone cable. You dialed in through the phone modem, and that was it. And then it switched to the Ethernet cables, but it was all a wire. The, the wireless didn't come until this century. So you, we have this exponential. It's not even exponential. If you go back a century, I mean, the the, the magnitude of the increase in the in the frequencies that we're exposed to, the biological frequencies of, of concern, have gone up ten to the twentieth. That's that's a hundred billion billion. Yeah. So. If that intrigues you, I've wrote, written a book, comes out, in a, and it's called EMF. And um, I am giving away a, a large portion of the most important chapter, which tells you how to mitigate against this, how to save and protect yourself and your family from that. So if you just go to my website, uh, emf.mercola.com, that's M E R C O L A, emf.mercola.com you'll be able to sign up for the newsletter and then get as a bonus this, I think it's a 30 page report, very colorful graphics, very easy to read and understand of what you can do to to protect you and your family from this exposure to EMS. Okay. That's great. Yeah. 
Well, I have your uh, your tube headphones that I that I bought the blue ones. Yeah, so, that uh, that's a start, but believe me, that's uh, uh, nothing more than a drop in the bucket compared to the, your their other exposures. Mm. And most people, you know, the idea, you know, one of the, with respect to the, the, the simple things you can do there, the equivalent of, of time restricted eating would be to make sure that your phone isn't on when it's on your body. It should be in airplane mode mm. because, you know, most people, how long does it take you to charge or how long does your phone, the charge on your bat on your phone last? So mine lasts about the day. That's it. But I use it a lot, okay. but yeah. So that means you're like it. most people. So do you ever wonder what happens to that energy? Well, I would hope it mostly gets dissipated, but I'm sure a part of it gets dissipated into me. Into you, right. And especially if you're wearing it in your pocket, like most people do when it's on. Mm-hmm. So all that energy that you're charging, that power is going somewhere. Now, when I, I have a phone and it's on all the time, but guess how long my phone lasts, my battery lasts rather, the charge. A week, I guess, if you're in airplane mode all the time. Uh, two weeks. Hmm. Two weeks. So, you know, I do use it if I'm traveling. I'll use it for a lift. If I have to get a quick look at my emails quickly, I'll look at it. But basically, it's in airplane mode. And I connect to the Internet through a wired connection. There is no Wi-Fi router in my house. There's, there's very low radiation. And all the tips and tricks and how to do this are in that chapter. So it's emf.mercola.com. Okay, that's great. It's a good resource. Yep. Well, Joe, you took a lot of time. I, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm glad that you're a pioneer and an ongoing advocate for you know for everyone's health. So, so thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.